Let's dive right in and read, um, beginning in Mark chapter 3, verse 13. We're going to read to the end of the chapter the word of the Lord in the Gospel of Mark. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve of them and called them his apostles. They were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. These are the twelve he chose, Simon, whom he named Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip, Bartholomew and Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. One time Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan... Cast out Satan, he asked. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who would tie him up and then plunder his house. I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus and Someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, who is my mother? Sorry, I just thought of the the book of the little bird running around, who is my mother? I didn't think about that while I was reading it this week. Sorry, that just popped into my head. Did anybody else read that book? Okay, all right, good. A few of us. Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, look. These are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. <clears throat> it's a really interesting passage that we have here to look at in Mark chapter 3. Let's begin by talking about this house divided. We're going to start with the 12 apostles, because that's where uh, Mark begins in the, the first part that we read. So as we venture deeper now into Mark's gospel, you can feel the ministry of Jesus ramping up, right? He's not alone anymore. He has these followers who are traveling with him everywhere he goes. And so now he he, he comes to the point where he's got to say, okay, are these just going to be a bunch of roadies or do I do something with them, right? Is this just my group of followers who kind of stick with me everywhere or can I make something of them? Can I take some of them and begin to fashion something different out of them, call them to a different sort of life, and really give them something to do? Not just sit around and and listen and and awe and wonder at me, but what can I do with these people? So he chooses these 12 men. So this chapter helps give his ministry a lot of shape here early on in Mark's gospel. I bet there are a lot of people in here who probably... You might could guess how many senators we have in, in the U.S. Senate. How many of you actually think you could probably guess the precise number of senators that we have in the U.S. Senate? Okay, now how about the U.S. House of Representatives? How many of you could accurately guess how many representatives we have in the U.S. House? Michael thinks he can. Okay, maybe a couple, right? Those numbers don't necessarily stick out to us like a sore thumb, do they? We go, well, we know there are senators, and... We know there are representatives, but how many? How many are there? By the way, there are 100 senators and 435 in the House of Representatives. But how about your state government? 
How many state senators do we have in Connecticut? How many, how many state in, how many in the state House of Representatives? I honestly don't know. I didn't actually do that research. Um, I did have to look up how many in the U.S. House of Representatives, because I, I forgot. I knew it was around 400. We have all these people representing us, and we don't actually know how many there are. Some of you could probably guess how many we have on the Supreme Court, how many justices we have on the Supreme Court. But I have no doubt that almost each and every one of you, before walking in the room this morning, if I told you, or if I asked you rather, how many apostles were there? How many of you would have known the answer to that? And it's not just because 12 is an easy number to remember. It's because as people who grow up hearing these stories, 12 really sticks out to us, right? There's a reason for that because biblically, it sticks out. And so you even know some of the significance behind the number 12, right? It's no secret to those of us who read God's Word that the number 12 is found frequently and most often in really positive circumstances surrounding God and God's people. Most notably, the number 12 is how many children the great patriarch Jacob had, right? So the number 12 had really great meaning, significant meaning to the Jews of Jesus' day, but, but why? Why should the people of his time care about that number? Because the truth is, by the time Jesus comes around, there aren't 12 tribes anymore. They're gone. They've been scattered to the winds. See, the Assyrians came over and destroyed the northern kingdom. We talked about that several weeks ago when I walked through the Old Testament. The Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom. Ten of those tribes, just gone. Some of the people got to stay behind. Most were taken off into exile in Assyria. Very few of them came back. And ever since that point, they, they never reformed. They never regrouped. They no longer cared about ancestral land, about tribal things. What about the southern tribes, though? They were still intact, right? Well, not really, because the Babylonians came and overthrew Jerusalem, right? They destroyed the southern kingdom. <clears throat> and again, even though a lot of them returned, they still never really reformed the nation that they were before. You can, you can go read about that more in Ezra and Nehemiah if you're interested. But we also know, and, and here's where knowing the Old Testament really does aid in our understanding of the New Testament. We also know that the people, at least some of them, were anticipating a time a coming age that they called the day of the Lord when God was going to show up and the 12 tribes of Israel were going to be one once more. See, many of the pro prophets spoke about that day in great anticipation. They told the people, wait for the time of the Lord, for the day of the Lord to come. I don't think it's any sort of stretch to say that Jesus ushered in that restoration, this time that the people were anticipating. And if that's true, then his choosing the twelve definitely was his way to signal to the people around him, what you are waiting on is coming true right now, in your midst, today. Today is the day of the Lord, which again only confirms everything that we've read up to this point about what Jesus has called, who he is, right? Mark begins his gospel this is the gospel about Jesus, the Son of God. God is in their midst, fulfilling the promise that was made so long ago. Mark also tells us why these apostles have been chosen. Two things, to preach and to have authority over demons. Now, preaching we all get. That one makes sense, right? <coughs> Jesus had a message to send to the people. Well, how do you get that message out? You sit and do nothing, right? That's how we all know a message gets out to other people. You sit and do nothing. No, of course not. You need people to go and tell others about that message. right? Jesus can only reach so many people. He needs others to take up that message and to share it. Preaching we get. That one makes a lot of sense. But why authority over demons? I mean, we still have preachers today. I'm standing in front of you right now. I've never seen demon possession. 
Right? Jesus called me to preach. I believe that. Okay? I haven't been called to exercise demons, at least not that I know of yet. So why not? Why, why don't I have authority over the demons? Why, why did Jesus give them authority over demons? What's that all about? Why not give his apostles authority over Rome or over other earthly kingdoms that they might come in contact with, right? Because they're going to spread eventually. They're going to go beyond Rome. They're going to travel into Africa. They're going to travel into Asia and go everywhere in the world that they can go. Why not give them authority over human rulers? That would make more sense, right? Perhaps two reasons could be at play here. One is that he knew that was precisely the sort of Messiah that the people were looking for. right? They wanted a Messiah to have authority over earthly kingdoms. They wanted a Messiah to rise up, to raise them up, to overthrow Rome, to knock every enemy down in their way on their path to spreading God's kingdom. But of course, we know that's not the Messiah that Jesus was and was never meant to be. The second reason... Perhaps it's because our fight isn't actually against earthly kingdoms. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus understood that there's a different power at play in the world other than human kingdoms. I think sometimes we get distracted by the sorts of fights. We, we see it happening right now, right? There's a, there's a lot happening in the country of Iran. There's a lot of reason to get kind of pulled into that politically and think, and this is, this is a fight. And God is going to be on our side in this fight, right? But as Christians, what do we have to remember? The fight is not against flesh and blood. Those aren't my words. That's Paul. You can go read that in Ephesians chapter 6 if you want. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. I think Jesus knew that. There's a different power in the world that we're up against. Sometimes we get sucked into thinking that our, our job is to, to dive into this political realm, right? Jesus had a different idea for his apostles. I really like his message here to them. To preach, to have authority over the demons. And then we come to this interesting place in chapter 3. Where, what is Jesus doing? Is it by Satan or by the Holy Spirit? Who's really behind Jesus' power? Who's supporting him? Who's his financial backer? Right? Who's on his side? Because <clears throat> the people are really uncertain. They're really not sure what's going on with this Jesus character. But it's not just the religious authorities. Who else is uncertain about him? His family. And we don't know exactly what led Jesus' family to this point. And in fact, we read in Luke that, that Mary pondered the things that Jesus was going to do in her heart. She seemed to believe when he was very young or even before he was born, he's destined for greatness, right? You can go read Mary's song in Luke. And yet we come to this point where his family believes that he's crazy, that he's out of his mind with what he's doing. And we could speculate come up with all sorts of scenarios that explain uh, how they might be feeling, right? That maybe they've been confronted by other religious authorities, and so they're afraid. Right? Perhaps fear is driving them in this moment that they don't want to be on the outs like he is. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Maybe they've been pressured to keep uh, Jesus quiet because of what he was teaching and, and doing. Perhaps they're, they're fearful of the Romans, that the Romans are going to sweep down because he's now having these large crowds follow him. And if they're beginning to think that an uprising might happen, well, that's the very thing that Rome would want to put down, which they did later on in Jesus' life. Maybe they're preserving family honor. Perhaps they see and they, they hear what he's doing and saying, and they're afraid that it's going to reflect poorly on them. And so they need to preserve their family honor. Whatever the case, we truly don't know what it was. His family is clearly not on his side in this moment. I wonder, I wonder what that did to Jesus. I wonder how that affected him and his life. 
his ministry. To have his family say, I'm not so sure about you anymore. We can't sign off on what you're, you're doing. It's a very difficult message to take, even for Jesus. Then Jesus is confronted by some of the religious authorities in this moment, and his motive is questioned. The translation from which I read a few minutes ago said Satan, and, and not Beelzebul, as some of your translations might have said. And I thought about taking you down the rabbit hole I went down this past week, because I did. I went down a rabbit hole researching who is Beelzebul or Beelzebub. What's up with that name? Let's just say it is a rabbit hole. If you want to chase that, feel free to do it on your own time. What I'm going to say is that by the time of the New Testament, by the time of Jesus, um, the Jews had taken up... This is a... Uh, no, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole. Man, I almost did. I almost went off on that. Essentially, uh, Beelzebul and Satan had become the same person. Okay? So the translation I use is just trying to help us as modern readers to get past some of that, uh, the language that is more difficult for us and just saying... They believe this is Satan, and they, they really very much would have, okay? The truly important point is not whether it's Beelzebul or Satan, though. Instead, the important thing is to look at what Jesus said in this moment. Jesus points them to the truth, that if a civil war breaks out in the kingdom, what's going to happen? The kingdom is, is done for, right? It, it's no longer going to cease to be the same place. If members of a household start fighting... Well, Thanksgiving, right? When your family gets together at Thanksgiving and Christmas, all of a sudden the tensions rise as people don't want to talk about certain things, or if they do, heaven forbid, now people have to go to their separate corners, their different rooms, and cool down. And We know what it is to fight in family. But what happens to the family in those moments? You really sort of cease to be family, don't you? It really hurts and affects who you are as a family. So, essentially, what Jesus is saying to them is, you're fools, without calling them fools, because they don't see the truth of what they're saying. And what's really damaging about all of this is, to me, that we get caught up in exactly the same thing. We don't understand somebody else's point of view. We don't like something that they've said. So we think, man, Satan's behind what they're doing. Man, they, they're a modern-day Hitler. They just want to wipe everybody out. You hear that a lot in political speech, don't you? Disagreements immediately go to the worst, the most negative place that they can. This sort of talk, this sort of thinking about other people, actually causes us to see them differently, to no longer see them as human anymore, and thus they clearly aren't deserving of any respect whatsoever because they disagree with me, or they disagree with the person that I agree with, and so that means they're wrong and I have to hate them for it. This is the sort of speech that, that we hear today, especially in modern political discourse. Let me tell you, that sort of talk is from Satan. I don't mean the person who's saying it is Satan. I'm saying that they're being influenced to say something that comes from Satan. When we, when we refuse, when we choose to no longer see other people as human, and to put on them all this animosity and hatred that really probably isn't there, it does something to us. It changes us. It, it affects who we are as much as it affects them. Probably even more so. We have to be very careful with our words. And I think that's what Jesus is saying here about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Doris asked me about this on Wednesday. She was like, oh, you're going to get into it on Sunday, aren't you? And look, I don't have a lot to say about it because I don't 100% understand what Jesus is going for here. I think anybody who does is kind of kidding themselves. Here, here's, here's what I think about this passage, though. I think Jesus is instructing us to be careful with our words. To be careful and thoughtful that whenever we are evaluating something, 
that we ascribe the right motive to it. Right? Because what have the religious authorities come along and done? They've seen that Jesus has power. They can't deny it. They can't stand before him and say, you're not doing any of this because they see it happening. It's happening right before them. So what do they have to do? They have to find some other place that it must be coming from than the place that they, right, they, they can't really believe that God would be doing this, can they? Because if God were doing it, then that would, that would support Jesus. We can't do that. So where else does power come from in their minds? It comes from Satan. Satan is the other one with power at war with God. It's kind of like a person who believes in conspiracy theories. It doesn't matter what you say to them. They're going to find a way to slip out of it. And every piece of evidence they find is just going to bolster support for their side. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, no matter what you show them. It's like people who believe in flat earth. You can say whatever you want to them. They've got to come back for it. You can show them pictures of, 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 the, of the, the earth from the moon or, you know, from astronauts who are, who are in space. Those are fake. They're all fake. And they're going to find a way to prove that they're fake. I think that's the mentality that the religious authorities are in with Jesus. It doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't matter what he does. They're so far down this track. They have to believe that the power is coming from somewhere else. And by saying, by ascribing his power as coming from somewhere else, they are in danger of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Our words matter. I think that's what Jesus is saying, that our words matter. And so how we talk about people, what we say about them, the motives that we ascribe to them, we better be very careful about what we're saying. The final point from this section that I wanted to look at, Jesus says, I'm not sure how your translations say it, but he says something along the lines of, truly I say to you, or amen, I say to you, verily I say to you, all the different ways of, of translating the word amen. What's interesting about this way of speaking is this is completely contrary to the way that any other teacher of Jesus' time would have spoken. Here's how other teachers would have spoken at Jesus' time. They might have said something like, Moses said to you. And so now I'm going to interpret what Moses said to you. Or perhaps, the Lord says to you. And they would read one of the prophets, and then they would say, here's how that applies to us today. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus comes along and says, I, I say to you, truly, I say, verily, I say to you, this is the way it is. So by what authority is, is Jesus speaking? Well, the authority that he's claimed to have all along, right? The authority from God. And Mark, again, right up front in Mark chapter 1, tells us who this guy is. Jesus, the Son of God. He speaks by the authority that his Father gives him. And so it's a very different way of speaking, but it's a powerful way whenever you understand the context of how others around him would have been teaching and speaking at that time. The final thing I want to look at today are, are family matters. Now, this final section in chapter 13, in all honesty, is a little difficult to read if you love your family, right? I suppose if you don't like your family, you're like, yeah, Jesus, go get them. You tell that family off. Because some of us sometimes want to do that with our family. And even when we argue with cousins, even when our grandfather goes on and on about the same story he's told us a million times. Because he forgets that he told it. And all the other things that families do that are weird, it's strange, and we just, we throw up our hands and go, why? What is happening with this family right now? Even through all of that, we still claim those people as family. Right? That weird uncle, he's still your weird uncle. And you claim him as family. You may not like him. You may not want him around at Thanksgiving, but he's there. And you claim him as family. I wondered this week, I've, I've never considered this before. I wondered if Jesus was sort of just being a, a little petty back at his family because of the, the statement that he's crazy. My family calls me crazy. I don't have a family anymore. 
You're, new, you're now my mothers and brothers and sisters. I don't need them anymore. I, I doubt he's really being petty, but that thought occurred to me for the first time this week. doesn't sound like Jesus, though. Maybe he was just trying to get back at them, but I doubt it. Perhaps, perhaps he's actually so disappointed in their lack of faith. I want you to think about here and compare and contrast for a moment the story we looked at last week. The friends who brought the paralyzed man. They come to the house that Jesus is in. And then what do they do? They stop right there, right? They don't go any further. They don't do anything else to get him in the house. They just stay right there, and then Jesus comes out to them, right? They call for him, Jesus, somebody tell Jesus to come out and heal our friend. That's what happens in the story, right? No, of course not. They go up on the roof. They literally unroof the roof, and they go down in. They bring their, they bring their friend down in, and he gets healed. They weren't going to let anything stop them from getting in. Now think about his family in this moment. Jesus, again, in a house. He's in a household setting, surrounded by a great crowd of people, and his family can't get in. They're going to have the kind of faith that the friends did, right? They're going to go up on the roof and unroof the roof so that they can get down in and see their brother and their son and say, Jesus, we're here for you. That's what happens, right? No, they stand outside the crowd and say, hey, would you let Jesus know we're here? Go, go tell him we're out here. He'll come to us. We're his family. You see the, the lack of faith in his family? The disappointment that he must have felt that they wouldn't even show the same, the same level of faith that these four people who didn't even know him were willing to show on behalf of their friend who couldn't walk. His family stopped. They stopped trying. And they refused to go any further. The loyalty to family is really important. It's family, it, it's important uh, to American families. It was really important to Jewish families, especially of Jesus' time. It was part of the very social fabric of the people to be loyal to family. And, and, and you have to think about the differences. You know, now families scatter, right? I'm a couple thousand miles away from, from my nearest um, brothers and my mom. And they even live apart. But at Jesus' time in his day, they probably had two, three, sometimes even four generations living under the same house, family was a lot closer back then. Now, now that grandfather gets a little weird, we kick him out the door and say, hey, there's a nice place down the street for you. You can go live there. They'll take care of you. Loyalty to family is different. We still have it, but not to the same degree that they did. So for Jesus' family to be disloyal to him, to show the lack of faith that they do. Again, I can only imagine that it must have hurt him very deeply. And then he has this bold statement. He says the gospel, allegiance to him, allegiance to Jesus, those are what unite and define us as family. Those things make us family. Not the fact that we're related by blood. Not the fact that we're related by marriage. Not the fact that we have children and grandparents and all these other sorts of things. And so this statement sets the stage for what is going to be true of the church. The church consists of people from every tribe, every nation, every language across the world. And every person that calls on the name of Jesus is part of my family. That's powerful. <clears throat> That's a powerful statement to redefine family, especially in the midst of a society that holds family so tightly, so closely. And so we look at each other this morning in this room together. We are family. A lot of churches say that, especially when you're interviewing to go be a preacher. You go there, and they all start with the same thing. Oh, we're family. We love each other like family here. And you know, you kind of go, I'm oh, man. <laughs> yeah, right. They all say, every church says it. We're family. We're family. And it's, you know, the truth is, it's true. And it's a good thing. But it's, it's funny, because every church kind of holds that up. It's like, that's our thing. But every church is doing that, at least for the most part. There are some churches that, let's be honest, probably don't. 
We are family. Jesus redefines family in this moment for us and says, going forward, allegiance to me, faith in the gospel of whom I am, that's what defines you as family. That's a powerful statement. And it gives hope to people who maybe believing in the gospel sets them apart from their faith. Maybe belief in the gospel would tear them away from their family because believing in Jesus is not what we do as a family. For those people, we have a message. We're your family. In one sense, you may be losing a family, but in another sense, you're gaining a much larger family. I don't know about you, but that's good news. That's really good news. Is it good news enough to go tell people about it? Is that something you can share with people? Is that something you can take with you as you leave today? As you interact with coworkers and other people that you meet and say, I want to tell you about the family I've got. We're weird, but it's family. It's good news. It's the power of Jesus' words here. Because he redefines family for us and tells us who our true family is. So as we leave today, just a couple of things to take away. The first, what do your words reveal about how you think of others? Are your words uplifting, impatient, concerned, or harmful? All the other sorts of ways that we can speak our words. How you talk to and about other people. <clears throat> how does that reveal what you think of others? This is a tough question. Because uh, sometimes, and, and I will admit, this is me. Alright? Confession time. You ever know those people who take jokes too far sometimes? They think they're joking with you, but really the other person's not feeling the joke. And they're going a little too, a little too personal. That's that, that's the idea sometimes. So, are the ways that I'm speaking about other people are they helpful? Are they encouraging? Or are they actually harmful to the person about whom I'm speaking? It reveals a lot about who we are. We have to we have to think about the words that we use and the way that we say things. The final thing to think about. Does knowing and believing that this congregation is a family help you? Knowing that if you get in a bind, knowing that if something's going wrong in your life, that you have a family here that's going to support you, that's going to love on you and hug you and take care of you. That's what a family does for each other. We also argue sometimes. It's okay, too. Because ultimately, we care for each other. Do you believe that about this congregation, knowing that we are a family? So this morning, we offer you some family time. I might just start calling it that every week. It's not an invitation time, it's family time. If you have something that you need to tell your family, whatever it may be, something joyful, something sad, something hurting in your life, this family wants to hear it from you because we want to be family. We can't help you if we don't know about it. We don't have divine you know, powers to know what's going on in your life to know how to help you unless you let us know. So let us be a family to you this morning if there's a need that you have. Let us know about it as we stand, as we sing.